Hello and let's talk about the IMF downgrading India's economic growth. According to the IMF, that's the International Monetary Fund, India's economy will decline by 4.5% for the year 2020. And India is not alone in this mess. The global economy is also expected to shrink by 4.9% this year as COVID-19 continues to rage in many countries. The interesting or rather the depressing aspect is that this change in projections has happened in just a few months. The previous edition of the World Economic Outlook in which these numbers come, that came out in April, had predicted that India's GDP growth would be at 1.9%. So the fall in the estimate in the past three months is by 6.4%, which is pretty steep. The US economy is expected to contract by 8% this year. The only country bucking the trend is China, which will still see growth according to the report, but by just 1%. The report also says that 2021, which now seems ages away, will see a reversal of this trend. However, the important thing to note is that we still haven't seen the full extent of the COVID-19 crisis. Fresh waves of cases are being reported in many countries. The US, Brazil and India, which are key drivers of the global economy, are still very much epicenters of the disease. So it's totally unclear how long this crisis will last. And if the current situation continues, some of these numbers may even have to be revised further downwards. We talked to journalist and economic analyst Anindya Chakravarti on some of these issues. Thank you, Anindya, for joining us. So Thank the world, sure. world Economic Outlook, the report of the IMF is out and it seems to have a lot of bad news for both the global economy and for India's economy. So India's economy is supposed, which is earlier the estimate was it would probably grow. Now it's likely to actually contract. And uh, so does this seem like uh, uh, to start with, does it look like the damage stops here or is it likely to be much, much worse? You know, uh, one doesn't really know. I think that there are reasons to believe that the damage could be much, much worse because uh, you look at it. We've already had about two and a half uh, months of lockdown. And uh, uh, I know that the prime minister said that everything is back on track. And we know that is not uh, what the ground reports tell us. But uh, some amount of economic activity is obviously back. People have to make money. The problem is that India is not being able to control uh, the spread of COVID. It is increasing almost every day. And India's graph is uh, moving only in one direction. And the lockdown seems to have failed in controlling it. We are not testing enough. So we really don't know what the extent of... Uh, COVID is, and if there is a second wave, then things could get worse. What the IMF is saying is that, as uh, you pointed out already, that in April, IMF said that India's economy will grow by about 2%, 1.9%. It was at number two position at that time because uh, uh, it looked like there'll be a 21-day lockdown and India has acted very aggressively and this should stop things. Um, of course, that IMF didn't know that we had no preparation. It was an ad hoc lockdown. We had no preparation when it came to health services. We had no way to stop the spread of uh, what was happening. And two months later, in June, IMF has reversed that and is saying that India's economy is going to contract by 4.5%. Now, we've said earlier that these are uh, several other agencies have made worse predictions. And IMF, uh, uh, you know, when IMF came out with its uh, April report, all the Bhakt Mandali, the uh, great supporters of the Modi government. They said that, look, India is doing the best and India's economy is doing the best. I am ever said that. I don't see any of them saying anything right now because now India's rank in terms of GDP growth has dropped to joint 10. So uh, this is something that uh, should worry the government. But does the government have any answers to that? I don't think it has because it is even more of a fiscal fundamentalist and fiscal hawk than the IMF itself, uh, Prashant. The irony, yes. So the key question here, of course, is that as far as the uh, government is concerned, like you said, there are not many answers, but this is also a global phenomenon. So again, the global yes. estimates have also yeah. been, they've been revised. Yeah. And uh, this especially, the scene especially looks bad in the United States because we see yes. the case count increasing massively yeah. even right now. So this is, mm -hmm. uh, and, and many countries are actually reporting second waves, second or third waves as well. So yes, even globally, absolutely. I think there's no real uh, end in sight as far as the disease is concerned and the economic impact. Absolutely. The question is whether the disease is as virulent, as, uh, as uh, fatal as it was earlier. That's the question. Because, you know, in Italy, some doctors are saying that it might have mutated. 
We are seeing older people who were dying within six to seven days are now uh, going back home after six to seven days without any oxygen support, without any significant uh, support from respirators and stuff like that. So has that changed in some parts of the world? Have a certain degree of immunity already developed? Were people infected who were not identified? We don't really know that. Uh, the question is, how long can the economy get locked up? And what we can see, Prashant, is that uh, in, uh, in some parts of the world, the governments have uh, approached it very aggressively and they have managed to, um, you know, uh, you, uh, they turn things around in the economy, even uh, compared to what economists had predicted. We've seen that happen in the US, for instance, when it comes to jobs, right? Now, the question, the point also is that much of these Western countries are much more integrated with China. So the block, the slowdown in China affected them much more than it affects us. Because if we look at our imports from China, yes, large parts of our economy are also dependent on China. But we're still about 14, 15% dependent on China, our trade. But the US and Europe, is heavily dependent on daily goods uh, from China. China, on the other hand, appears to have recovered much faster. Yes, even China is doing worse than the April prediction of IMF. And, uh, but even then, China is expected to grow by 1%. Many people had said that it will not. So China's recovery has been faster. Mm -hmm. India's has been slower. The rest of the world appears to be doing worse, except for some countries like New Zealand, which um, has... Uh, uh, of course, uh, supposedly eradicated COVID altogether. We know that in Beijing, for instance, there has been some amount of lockdown again. Schools have been shut because of the second wave. There's been a quick action. The question is whether India has the ability to deal with the economic impact of COVID-19. The fact that so many people are losing income and increasingly that is happening. The longer this ex gets extended, the more it is going to affect people who are part of the formal and visible economy, Prashant. Because right. one thing that I have firmly believed that there is about 30 to 35 percent of India, at least one third of India, is not even captured properly by GDP data. So that part might be doing better now than it was doing earlier because of what the government has uh, done in, uh, and largely because of we know the Bihar elections, some amount of money is being pushed into Bihar, especially for migrant workers who don't want to go back. Uh, they carry a vote, their families carry votes, so they will be looked after uh, for now. The latest CMI, uh, last week we discussed this, Prashant and Mahesh Vyas of CMI has now uh, kind of backed it with new data showing that the rural economy seems to be doing better. Rural unemployment is now back to uh, pre-lockdown okay. days and that's not true for urban unemployment. So, Absolutely. so my point is that uh, if you look at the IMF, the IMF has suddenly turned socialist without saying so, right? Of course, it is doing that within its limits. We know that the IMF is one of those institutions which has pushed finance capital across the world over the last 40 years, right? right. It has virtually been a uh, the, 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 you know, the poster boy, the things which has pushed the ideology of finance capital, mm -hmm. privatization, globalization, uh, decontrol, deregularization, financialization across the world. So uh, now suddenly IMF has started talking about public spending, government uh, investing in a new economy, which is going to be more environment friendly, retraining workers, because it is not sure that the private sector can do that. It is saying that the government has to provide uh, hiring incentives. It has to give uh, private sector incentives to hire people. It has to hire people directly. It has to give uh, unemployment benefit to a larger number of people. So in a sense, it is rediscovering socialism, which uh, it helped defeat uh, for the last 40 years. Or a model of welfare capitalism from the yeah, 70s and yeah. by socialism I mean <coughs> right. what uh, they call socialism, right? Exactly. Essentially, a state capitalism, exactly. a form of state capitalism. Obviously, exactly. not uh, uh, right. the socialism. That right. What they call socialism uh, and anything that smelt of anything that had the scent of being of any kind of welfare, right? Absolutely. Right. Yeah. But uh, to come back to the Indian context, 
does even the IMF push or say calls by experts from across the country, does any of it seem likely to convince the government to move in a different direction? Because we've, you know analyzed, the stuff, we've analyzed the government's pro thinking process, which is, of course, like you said, it's very targeted towards the votes. It uh, has specific categories in mind. But all this is not generally likely to have an economy-wide effect, as far as we understand. My belief is that it will have the exact opposite effect, and we've discussed this earlier, because what is being given is essentially very low subsistence level right. Uh, income, right? right? Even if all the Manrega uh, expenditure is concentrated mm -hmm. in, let's say, the next six months, right? Because it uh, takes place in waves. Even then, on an average, a worker who gets a Manrega job will earn about, uh, at best, 5,000 rupees from it. And if there's no other work around, uh, of course, we know that the monsoon has been better. Maybe there'll be a little bit of additional work they'll get in agriculture. But what is it? 6,000, 7,000, 8,000 rupees a month household income. Uh, and uh, that is hardly anything. That is not going to push the needle when it comes to demand for what the uh, or the rest of the economy produces, right? So at best, uh, it'll increase. Uh, we know that poverty has uh, reduced people's expenditure on food. So maybe that will recover first, right? Because poor people spend most of their money on food. And that, that will probably recover a little bit. There might be a higher amount of medical expenditure. But to say that demand for fast-moving consumer goods, demand for anything else, durables, that's good to revive because of government spending at that level is, uh, I think, uh, 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 just a dream. It's not going to happen. If the government had spent much more, generated real jobs, we know that Manrega jobs are essentially a kind of unemployment benefit, right? It's essentially a holding operation. Uh, it's like uh, what uh, the Nawab of Awad supposedly did when he built the Bada Imam Bada, and you know, at, uh, during the famine, and uh, uh, the famine uh, caused huge amount of unemployment and hunger. So supposedly, workers were told, build uh, something during the day, uh, day and break it down at night. And they would essentially, and that's where the Dampuk cuisine emerged. Uh, supposedly, they would put food, meat and spices and everything together and bury it under the ground, under the embers, and it would get cooked by early morning. Now. That is the kind of unemployment benefit scheme that the government seems to have worked out. This is not productive in the sense that it doesn't really create sustainable jobs which uh, lead to better lives. It, uh, it does not really create assets in the, the sense that it should. That money could have been spent directly by public sector units through government contracts to create real jobs, not just jobs to dig holes, which... Uh, Unfortunately, in many parts, Manrega had become. So effectively, the government is doing a band-aid solution. It is, it could push up wages, uh, as we discussed last time. It could push up wages. And if that happens uh, for entrepreneurs, since in the last seven to eight years where we've had this economic slowdown, uh, much of urban uh, self-employed people have operated in two or three sectors, uh, Prashad. Real estate has been declining, but there's still been that. A certain amount of construction, trade, finance, retail, right? Uh, these have been the big uh, areas where uh, people have kept themselves, sustained their margin. And a lot of it is because of very poor, low paid wages that come from migrant workers. Ten, one crore migrant workers have left, and that is the number of people who are unemployed were unemployed pre-lockdown in urban India, right? About 8 to 9% of uh, the total uh, number of people who were appearing for work, the, uh, those who were participating in the labor, uh, in the workforce. Right. Now, effectively, that one crore people not returning in the next six, seven months is if going to be, going to squeeze margins in these spaces. And that is, the, the only way to stop that is to do what? Cut down on advertising, cut down on uh, administrative costs, cut down on marketing costs, uh, freeze uh, white collar wages because blue collar wages you have to pay because those are the people who have left, right? And uh, that, that's trouble for the middle class. And when the middle class's income gets squeezed, 
that is a problem for demand overall for the banking system for loans for cars for fast moving consumer goods shampoo soaps everything is going to slow down even more than uh, what it did and right. the imf said that you know that uh, governments should essentially give tax benefits to consuming groups and i don't see anything having been done the only thing we are seeing is actually a tax increase on fuel as the right. economy opens up Thank you, Arindya, so much for talking to us. Thanks a lot, Prashant. That's all we have in this episode of Let's Talk. We'll be back on Monday with major news developments from the country. Until then, keep watching News Click.